Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Energy Minister Jeff Khadebe believes the energy sector can contribute $25 billion to the $100 billion investment target set by President Ramaphosa for the coming five years. Terence Screamer joins me to speak about prospects for investment in the sector. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. How did the minister arrive at this figure and is it realistic? Well, I'm not sure how the figure was arrived at, but uh, I think I suppose when you talk about energy related investments, these are big ticket items. So even if you're investing in a utility scale solar plant or a uh, wind farm, these are in, run into the uh, billions of rands. As we saw with the last 27 projects which were signed, uh, RPP projects, all renewable, mostly wind and solar, uh, one uh, biomass project, uh, that collectively is, is sort of uh, 56 billion rands worth of investment. So it is, a lo uh, there always are large ticket items. Mm -hmm. And when we look at some of the projects that um, the minister is talking about, so he's muted a, a greenfield oil refinery. He's talking about further gas to power investments, a gas pipeline from Mozambique, uh, the opening up of shale gas uh, mining and uh, extraction and tr logistics uh, in the uh, in the Karoo area. Uh, uh, that is obviously going to be highly controversial, but these are these would be very large uh, capital investment projects. So I suppose if you look at the the hundred billion dollar very ambitious target over a five-year horizon. Um, if we were to get all the energy projects going, and we and whether there was uh, the other thing is whether there's enough demand, and if there is demand for energy, um, uh, given potentially growth in the economy, then I suppose the figure could be realistic. But I think a lot would have to be put in place before uh, we get that sort of level of investment in the energy space. Policy certainty will be essential for attracting such large investment flows. That's for sure. I think that's been an area of real weakness in the energy space over the last few years. So we've seen that most of the focus has been on electricity investment and there basically we've had a po policy void for a couple of years. Um, and I think the, uh, the minister is trying to get his head and his hands wrapped around that issue in the electricity space. So we've had an integrated resource plan that was last uh, uh, updated in 2010. It assumes massively higher uh, demand um, uh, than we actually are experiencing. And uh, it assumes uh, a generation, a portfolio of generation assets being developed that are uh, both at a faster scale, uh, a bigger scale and at a faster pace. So for instance, nuclear 9.6 uh, gigawatts of nuclear by 2030. Now we know that's not going to happen, but uh, what I think the minister has committed to is to revamping this RP. And at the moment, apparently the final technical work uh, is underway on the RP. Uh, it will then go back into some form of uh, public consultation. We had the road shows uh, a, a year, more than a year ago uh, looking at uh, the, the draft 2016 RP update, which was heavily criticised, um, but we've we now going, we haven't had visibility yet of the the draft uh, revised update f f following that roadshow, and that should be any day now. We should see a, a released document, and there'll be a, a short period of public consultation, public comment, as well as a process within NEDLAC, It seems where the stakeholders will, will have discussions around the RP. And then by th they say by the 15th of August they would like to present this document to Cabinet for approval. If it is approved, it will be gazetted. And then we, we should have certainty on our generation roadmap for, um, uh, for electricity. And that's going to be crucial for any, uh, providing any certainty for investors on which to uh, you know, pursue their projects. And it will also give us a, a visibility of the type of projects we're going to invest in. But that's only one of the spaces that the minister is, is talking about investment. The liquid fuels in the gas space is also very deeply uncertain. Some of the gas to power obviously will, will be brought to the fore through the RP, but how South Africa is going to unlock the gas economy in South Africa requ requires a master plan. That master plan is not finalized. Liquid fuels similarly, um, are we going to be a, 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 a location where we really just become a very efficient importer of final product, or do we want to continue refining? Now there, we've got a refining a fleet uh, that's already in place. 
that a refinery fleet is outmoded in terms of the fuel specification that it can produce. So either we need to upgrade that um, in a way that they can start producing the, the cleaner fuels uh, that the, the automotive industry is demanding, or the alternative that's being mooted now is uh, an oil refinery. Um, I imagine it's the cooker uh, project being, being brushed off again and being looked at. That would have to be of a certain scale um, to be able to keep, say, South Africa balanced in terms of however we want to see the security of supply between import and export. That will be a very uh, interesting discussion, whether that is the best, uh, best way to go. And uh, he, again, the Minister has promised consultation on that. And then obviously gas, you know, the shale gas being one of the options, but there is, there is now potential to import gas much more easily um, because of the technology advancements that have had taken place. There is now a tradable market in uh, LNG. Do we become an efficient importer or do we look at uh, domestic exploitation of our shale gas? That's a big debate. What's going to be the most cost effective route? And then obviously our neighbours both uh, in Namibia, but especially in Mozambique, have got found massive gas discoveries. And what is more efficient to uh, unlock uh, to start mine, uh, mining in the Karoo for shale gas, or to link into the, uh, the Ravuma Basin? We already are linked into the Panda and Tamano fields through the the Romco pipeline. Uh, so again, uh, these these are these are very big decisions. And uh, going back to the first questions, they involve massive capital expenditure. And usually these are also long lead items. So within the five year period, it's it's may not be possible for all of these to come together. And ultimately, unless the economy is growing and unless demand is growing, we won't need some of these projects. Some of the projects floated appear contradictory, such as the call for the electrification of transport and a new oil refinery. Yeah, I think that's a lot has to be really consulted properly. I, and I think we need a big picture approach an integrated energy plan which I think will also be released quite soon that takes into account some of the changes that are happening in the world of energy and one of the big changes that is likely to happen over the next couple of decades probably longer is the electrification of mobility we're really seeing that um, uh, electric cars uh, there's many cities around in Europe in particular that want to uh, phase out internal combustion engines all the automotive companies have electrification strategies for their vehicles. Uh, we've started to see some of these even appearing on South African roads and the industry is quite keen uh, to expand that. They've asked for some duty relief, which it doesn't look like it's going to come. But the reason why it's not going to come is that on the other hand, we've got DTR wanting to keep the policy space open to do electric vehicle manufacturing in South Africa. So. That is a, it's a real um, issue. It's one that we have to grapple with. And if we are going to transition our economy to a renewables-led uh, system uh, of electrification, um, and so th th that changes the game quite considerably. Now, we've always been a coal-based, a coal-led economy. We know the constraints environmentally around that, and also the cost of, coal is, of new coal has become much more expensive. So if we are going to transition and use our formidable uh, solar and wind resources, which are you know, if relatively better than most of the countries in the world if you combine them. And we build our electric, electric system, electricity generation system around that. Then we have to look at how we ensure that the variability is taken care of. Obviously, the short term, there's uh, pumped uh, hydro and there's, there'll be gas. Some of that will be, uh, need to be imported probably in the short term and you'd also use your coal fleet to help you balance the system. But then, you know, the, the best way to decarbonize mobility, which is the next big uh, ticket item, would be to electrify your vehicle fleet. And here you've got an opportunity to domesticate the fuel that goes into uh, the vehicle fleet in the sense that electricity will be produced from the solar and wind primarily. There may be some imported gas in there balancing it, but primarily it will be a RAN based uh, electricity cost and you can sort of domesticate the fuel which is currently a massive uh, revenue uh, uh, outflow for the country in the form of imported crude that we refine or imported final product. So if we are going to look at a decarbonization of our electricist electricity system through renewables and we're going to try and then move to the decarbonization of mobility, the transport sector, that it really 
it doesn't make a lot of sense to be talking about a, a new crude oil for refining, for instance. So these are big debates, <laughs> and they're big, uh, they're big uh, decisions to make, and we need to make them uh, with our wi eyes wide open with what uh, what is the transitions that are happening around the world, and especially with an eye to cost, because uh, we've already seen in South Africa the the sort of really deleterious effects of a, a spike in electricity prices on the economy. And we can't afford to pursue projects that are going to raise the costs, or we're not. We can't also pursue projects that are so that are, you know, an oil refinery will take five to ten years to plan, five to ten years to build, and you operate for sixty years. Do you build a stranded asset? So, these are very, very, very delicate <laughs> and uh, complicated discussions, and I think we need to have them really out in the open as much as possible. Uh, I think the days of being of people doing. Um, these sort of plans uh, in a very confined way, with, with only with technocrats and with very, very narrow mandates, I think are over. We really need very much uh, public engagement, stakeholder involvement in this to say what is really the, the, the best way both to deal with the decarbonisation of the economy, which we're committed to, but really to do this in, in the, the least cost way. And on the electricity side, I'm not, even, I'm not talking about mobility, but the trade-off between clean and, uh, and cheap is no longer really a problem for South Africa, given our formidable renewable resources and given, our, given the falling costs of wind and solar. It really is the only logical solution. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.